Heavenly Father, we come before you again, and I just pray that you would bless us as we read and study your word right now. Help us as we look at this subject that Jesus has for us today. God, it's, uh, it's really not hard subject. Sometimes it's just hard to explain things, and so I pray that wherever, Lord, I fall short, uh, that and even where I, I, I'm accurate with this today, I pray that your spirit would just override everything and uh, apply this to our hearing and to our lives and help us to see what this means uh, and what we need to do with your word today. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, I'm just gonna read the text and then we'll get started looking at it here in just a moment. But Matthew 5, 21 to 26, Jesus says that you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. So that's our text today. And I'd just like to back up a little bit and give you some background, some context as we, how we get to this one today. So every week so far in this series of the Sermon on the Mount, we've talked about righteousness. Righteousness defines and describes the life of a disciple of Jesus. Those who are righteous or beatitude people. We studied those a few weeks ago. The beatitudes show the qualities and the life choices that God's disciples make. Those who are righteous, those who make those choices, who live that way, will be persecuted because the world hates righteousness. And that's why they crucified the Lord Jesus, who was the embodiment of righteousness, the one who never did anything wrong went to the cross and died. So what did Jesus do wrong? Well, nothing. Why didn't people like him? He wasn't a murderer. He wasn't a liar. He wasn't a thief. He wasn't a gossip. He always honored his father and mother. He kept the Sabbath day holy. He did not covet. He didn't commit adultery. And he put God first in everything. So why did he get crucified? He didn't do anything wrong. He perfectly and fully kept the law of God. Why was Jesus murdered upon a cross? Well, I think there's two reasons, two answers to that. One is people hate righteousness. They love the darkness rather than the light. And having a righteous person around exposes their unrighteousness and makes them uncomfortable. I think that could be one reason. A second reason could be this, that Jesus went to the cross because that was God's way to save everyone who would trust in Jesus as their Savior. In other words, what men meant for evil, God meant for good. Men meant to put him to death and that was the end of it. But God said, no, that's not the end because he rose Jesus from the dead. And so what men, men planned for evil, God meant for for good. So listen, righteous living can cause those who don't live righteously to react in one of two ways. One way is that the Holy Spirit will use the righteous living of a believer and the walk and talk of that person to convict the lost person of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The other way that uh, the lost person, the other way that God will use the righteous living of a, of a believer is that the lost person, the unsaved person, the non-Christian, as we might say, will condemn and persecute the one who lives righteously because they don't like the discomfort, they don't like the dissonance that can occur 
righteousness on this person's part makes them feel bad because they're not righteous. And it's not because the Christian is trying to make them feel bad or feel wrong or anything like that. But a lot of it is because God has built into every single person a sense of right and wrong because everyone's made in his image. And along with being made in his image comes those senses, those oughtnesses, those we, what we just know to be true innately. And so a person feels convicted, they don't like feeling that way, so they get rid of that which they think is making them feel bad. And they would rather be affirmed that they're okay when God says they're not. Um, now, when, when a righteous person, when a believer is persecuted for just trying to be faithful to the Lord, persecuting the righteous is like someone who sees the doctor and the doctor tells him, you've got three months to live. You have Gronin's disease. I can see five clear symptoms from your physical condition and your blood work. This is very serious. This is very severe. It's a good thing we caught it when we did because I have the antidote to cure you right here. But rather than saying, give it to me, the patient kills the doctor because the doctor made him feel bad. It doesn't make sense. The doctor would not go along with the lie that this man was well simply because he thought he was. So a disciple lives a righteous life and can expect to be persecuted for it. But next, as we left the Beatitudes, we saw that when we live righteously before God and others, we're like salt and light. Salt acts as a preservative that slows moral and spiritual decay and spoilage. As for light, um, where light shines, it chases away the darkness. It dispels the darkness. It reveals things as they really are. And whereas salt is hidden, light is obvious. And salt works secretly while light is, works openly. Salt works from within and light works from without. Salt is more of an indirect influence of the gospel, if you will, while light is more the direct communication of the gospel. Salt works primarily through our living while light works primarily through what we preach, teach, and say. So those who are righteous, Jesus refers to them as salt and light. And then last week, we learned that we need righteousness that is beyond our ability to obtain. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. We don't deserve it. And the righteousness we need to get into heaven must be given to us by God himself. And the way a person gets this righteousness that they need to go to heaven it's by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the one who completely and utterly fulfilled God's law for all of his children. Jesus' righteousness gets imputed uh, to a person the moment that person puts his or her trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happens is God takes away that person's sin, having atoned for it on the cross, and gives him his righteousness. And so we must be righteous to enter the kingdom of God. And so today we come to this passage that shows us that righteousness is revealed not only in our actions, but also in the thoughts we think and the words we speak. So righteousness is both internal and external. So Think with me about this. Suppose a man wants to kill his enemy, but is kept from doing it by some unforeseen circumstance. Is he innocent because he did not have the opportunity to follow through on his desire to kill the man? 
suppose he's too cowardly to kill but he would like to do it or suppose he's just afraid of getting caught what if he only hates his enemy or insults him is he still innocent of breaking the sixth command of thou shalt not murder well the scribes and the pharisees had argued yes a person is only guilty of murder if they actually shed human blood if they actually physically kill somebody so by teaching this the scribes and the pharisees nullified the law rather than upholding it and jesus on the other hand said wrong murder isn't limited to the unjust taking of physical life murder actually begins in one's thoughts and one's mind if you have hatred in your heart you're a murderer at heart if you say hateful things about or to another person you're a murderer at heart as evidenced in your words so in verses 21 and 22 Jesus corrects the scribes and Pharisees understanding of the sixth commandment by amplifying it beyond the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. What God most certainly meant when he gave this commandment. He says, you heard it was said to those of old back in the day, in Moses' day when this was given, you shall not murder. And we know that that's true. That's what the Bible says. We studied the Ten Commandments a few months ago. Whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, and this is going to be a trend we're going to see in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is going to say, you've heard that it was said, but I say. Jesus brings a correction to the current interpretation, the incorrect interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount, of the scribes and the Pharisees. So this is what he's doing. He's correcting him in verse 22. I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. We'll just stop right there. Jesus says in verse 22, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, what does that mean to be angry without cause? And I know some of your versions might not even have the words without cause there. But what is that? What does it mean? Anger without cause is selfish anger. It's anger against a brother, whoever that might be, whether it's a fellow believer or just any neighbor that you might have. Uh, it's selfish anger against a brother because he has done something against you or simply irritates and displeases you. It's a brooding a simmering anger that's nurtured and not allowed to die as in the holding of a grudge and the smoldering bitterness uh, that refuses to forgive it is the anger that cherishes resentment and does not want reconciliation you just you're gonna keep on hating this person in fact you kind of get pleasure out of it the writer of Hebrews identifies this as a root of bitterness. So if you have this kind of anger in thought or word, know that this is the kind of anger that always precedes actual physical murder. Someone is not going to murder without having the thought first. It is murder in your heart. It is a murderous attitude. If you commit murder in your heart, you will face the same demands and punishment of the law because the just judgment of God awaits murderers. But not only that, Jesus said, it's not only just being angry. He says, but whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Raka means stupid, empty-headed, or worthless fellow. It is a feeling of scorn, derision, and contempt. The very spirit that leads to murder. You know, 
we're pretty good at holding back and not actually physically murdering someone aren't we we can usually keep that at bay but our thoughts and words oh my let's be honest have we not often murdered in thought and word have we not tried to destroy someone's life have we not wished someone was dead have we not wished that someone would go to hell perhaps we've even told them that using those very words but that's not all Jesus continues he says whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire what does that mean it's it's just calling someone a fool you fool you moron you idiot these words are expressions of abuse and the vilification of a person this is bitterness and hatred in the heart expressing itself in words so Jesus in this passage is denouncing the self-righteous spirit of the scribes and Pharisees because they thought they had kept the law because they had never physically killed anyone. They could puff themselves up, they could pat themselves on the back and parade their self-righteousness before men. But Jesus brought a correction to this short-sighted and limited interpretation of the sixth command. The thoughts and words that generally precede the act are as much murder as the act. That's the way God says. Now I can hear someone now thinking, reasoning, well, if I think it, I might as well do it. If it's the same thing, why not? Wrong. Think about how much worse the consequences would be for so many people yourself included, if you actually physically murdered someone. People need to understand that they're both temporal and eternal consequences for sin. Try to think with me on this. There are people in prison right now, all over the country, who got saved while in prison. And they have new life in Christ, new priorities, new perspectives, a new purpose, they've repented and they hate what they did that got them in prison, that, they, that, that hurt so many people. And they wish, looking back, that they'd never done that. And now they can't even imagine ever doing that again. They've been forgiven by the Lord and when they die, according to God's word, they're saved, they're gonna go to heaven. So, but just because they're saved and because they're a new person and will go to heaven when they die does not erase everything they did in this life. They still have consequences to face, temporal judgment that society's laws have enacted upon them. Now that same prisoner has a different set of eternal consequences because before he was saved in prison his destiny was hell God's law was going to come down upon him and he would pay for his sins for all eternity but because he was saved his destiny was changed eternally his sins have been forgiven and he stands in the righteousness of Christ Christ's perfect life his atonement and his resurrection from the dead have taken this prisoner from darkness into light and out of death and put him into life. So heaven is now his destiny, even though he might spend the rest of his life in prison, serving his time because of the sins he committed and the laws that he broke. Eternally, he's free. God has forgiven him. He's heaven bound. But temporarily, he's in prison, receiving the consequences for what he did. We need to kind of remember that as we think about 
the consequences to our sins now perhaps the scribes of the fair sees thought that by being religious and going to the temple and to the synagogue and and staying busy in their religious work that somehow that would atone and make up for all the wrongs they had ever done maybe by doing that it would show god that they've turned over a new leaf and are serious about following him then he can just overlook all the bad they've done wrong it doesn't work that way a lot of people think that that's what happens that you can somehow atone and make up for all the bad you've done and get god on your side but that doesn't happen apart from faith in the lord jesus christ jesus said this in luke 16 verse 15 you were those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Look in verse 23 and 24. Therefore, if you can, if you, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Before we can truly worship God, we need to make sure we're reconciled to others. If you know of someone who has something against you, whether rightly or wrongly, maybe you didn't really do anything, but they think you did, you still need to be reconciled to that person or try as much as it's possible with you. And then resume your worship. Stop your worship. Take care of matters. Do all you can on your part to make things right and then come back and worship. Worship is not acceptable to God when there's hatred in the heart. That's one thing that's pretty clear Jesus is teaching here. The psalmist said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So you cannot be right with God until you put yourself right with man. Your attempt to worship away the sin of which you are guilty will not work. You cannot substitute worship for the work that you need to do. There's an example of this in the Old Testament. King Saul, he tried this. He was told, go and utterly destroy the Amalekites. But he decided he was gonna spare some of the people, some of the cattle, and some of the other animals because he thought a better idea would be sacrifice those to God. Well, Samuel, a prophet, showed up and said, hey, Saul, what have you been doing? And Saul said, I've been carrying out the commandments of God. Samuel said, well, what is this bleeding of sheep and lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul said, well, I thought it would be a good idea to spare some of them. And then Samuel said these words, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So Saul did not obey God's command and he thought that by performing a great act of worship, he could cover it up. All would be well and God actually does have greater delight in burnt offerings as he does in obeying. But that's not true. In fact, we all need to guard against believing the opposite of what God says. Just because something seems or sounds reasonable doesn't make it biblical or right. Not everything that sounds good is good and sound. And we should test all things by scripture. So, as we look at this passage before us today, if we just step back and see the big picture of this teaching, Jesus is saying is that righteous people, his disciples, work at reconciliation as far as it depends on them. Their first reaction is not one of anger, contempt, and hatred. Their first reaction comes from a heart of love, concern, care, and compassion. They continue to strive and help and assist other people. And they realize that the anger of man does not bring about the righteousness of God. So in this passage, what it seems like Jesus is saying here is that God's people are not to be angry with others in thought, word, 
or deed. Instead, we're to be reconciled with them. Strive to reach an agreement with our adversary, even if it is to disagree. People can disagree without being mean about it. I think that's what he's getting at in verse 25 and 26. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. So here's how it's laid out in the passage. We commit murder not only when we shed the blood of another person and they die, but we also commit the sin of murder when we're angry with someone without cause. There are times when we can be righteously indignant Maybe you've heard that. Paul says, be angry and sin not. So there's a way that we can do that. I'm not questioning that. But most times, if we're honest, there are sinful attitudes and there is a spirit of revenge and vengeance mixed in with our, too much of us is mixed in with it. So it's best to assume that our anger is contaminated by sinful motives and at heart is murderous. So let's be very careful of that. We can also sin with our words of contempt and derision. So rather than react with sinful attitudes, we should strive to be reconciled with one another, whether we have something against them or whether they have something against us or think they do. And finally, we need to settle out of court. We need to seek understanding we need to reach an agreement with those who have something against us. We need to do everything we possibly can to agree to some degree and not let the problem get out of control. If you don't get this matter under control, Jesus is saying here, it's going to come back to bite you and hurt you and could cost you a lot in this life and in the life to come, particularly if you've never turned to the Lord for salvation. In fact, the Apostle Paul put it this way in his letter to the Romans. He said, as far as it is possible with you, be at peace with all men. Amen. So in conclusion, my question for you today is, where do you stand with the Lord? Have you been saved? Are you striving to live righteously? Then amen. Praise God for that. We want that for you. If you're not saved, the Bible says, there's an easy answer. It wasn't easy for God, but it's easy for you. And that is just to call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon Jesus today to save you. He will. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Confess your sins to him. Repent of them. Turn from them and turn to God through Jesus Christ. He will make you righteous and will cause you to even live righteously. And so if you want to know more about what it means to be a Christian, about how to be saved, I want you to please come and see me after church or call me, text me, email me. My info is on the front of the bulletin. Um, I would love to talk to you about this because it's the best decision you can ever make in your life. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word today. Lord, it's, it can be hard to really figure out, is, is our anger justified? Is it, is it uh, righteous indignation? Or, or is there sin mixed in with this? And that can be hard for us, Lord. I pray your spirit would guide us in this. We don't want to be murderous at heart. We know that's not becoming and not descriptive of what a believer is. We want to be righteous people. We want to be at peace with all men as much as we're able. We want to be reconciled, Lord. You're the great reconciler sending Jesus uh, into the world to, to put people at, uh, right with you, to redeem them, to give them peace with you. Um, Lord, help us to just be honest before you today and Lord if we fall and fail in this area to confess and repent Lord and to, to get in your word more to, to get guidance from you and strength from your spirit to help us to live the way we should 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with a hymn that's hopefully related to what we're talking about today, and that's just having a pure heart. So uh, we're going to ask Rick.